Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Carla Thorson, the Vice President of Programs here at the club. And I'm really excited to be moderating tonight for this important conversation about women taking the lead on reversing global warming. Welcome to all of you joining us here in person and to everyone online. And thank you for spending some of your val valuable time to be here at the Commonwealth Club. So tonight's program is a collaboration with the Commonwealth Club's Civics Education Initiative, Creating Citizens, building on the club's foundational values of civility, mutual respect across divides, and informed action, Creating Citizens engages youth and adults in meaningful civic dialogue about the issues of our day so that they may become active, informed participants in our democracy. We are grateful to the Corette Foundation for their generous support of creating citizens and for their dedication to improving the quality of civics education in California and beyond. For more information about this program, Creating Citizens, you can find it on our website at commonwealthclub.org education. A quick reminder before we get started, please take a moment to silence all your cell phones, anything that goes beep or squeaks or chirps, <laughs> so that during the program we can hear only from our guests. And this goes for our speakers as well. <laughs> Uh, but we do want to encourage your questions. So if you're here with us in San Francisco and have a question for our speakers tonight, please do write them on the cards that you'll find on your chairs near your seats. And if you're watching along with us online, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube. And we'll be collecting these throughout the program and I will get to as many of them as possible later on in the program. Now, let me introduce our guests, Paula Gianturco and her granddaughter, Avery Sangster. Paula is an author and photographer who serves as a member of the International Women's Forum. Her previous work has documented women's issues in 62 countries, and her photos have been exhibited at the UN, the US Senate, and many museums. Her granddaughter, Avery, now a high school freshman, is also used to thinking about global issues. In the past, she and her sister created a children's program at an, at an annual international poverty conference, which they led for seven years. And when she was in sixth grade, Avery organized her classmates to create a website on climate change. At 12 years old, Avery joined her grandmother to interview and, photog and photograph excuse me, women activists, politicians, corporate executives, scholars, and heads of grassroots groups based in 10 countries. These interviews are now presented in COOL, the first book to document the inspiring work of women climate leaders globally. And here to talk with us tonight about this work, Please join me in welcoming this grandmother-granddaughter team, co-authors of COOL, Women Leaders Reversing Global Warming. Paula and Avery, thanks for coming to the Commonwealth Club. I'd love to know how you're feeling about climate change. I'm going to give you three options that may come close to your opinions and ask you to raise your hand when I get to something that seems like it represents your thoughts. Um, the first one is, I'll, I'll ask you in a minute, I'll give you the three first. The first one is climate change is not happening. The next one is climate change is happening, but it's not urgent. And the next one is climate change is happening, but it is urgent. So get ready to raise your hand when something sounds like what you think. Climate change is not happening. I see no hands. Climate change is happening, but it's not urgent. I see no hands. 
climate change is happening and it is urgent. Everybody's hands, <laughs> me too. Um, that's exactly what I think, but there's some good news. And that is around the world, women are beginning now to show us the way to a sustainable future. They are courageous, they are creative, they are effective. Our book, Cool, with its cover photographed by Avery, um, our book, Cool, Women Leaders Reversing Global Warming, tells 27 of those women leaders' stories in 10 countries, countries as far-flung as Sweden and Sri Lanka. One of those women leaders is in the room with us tonight, Chrissy Kiefer, who is from the Dance Mission Theater and has a whole chapter um, devoted to her important work. Thank you for joining us. Now, please meet my granddaughter and co-author, Avery Sangster. We began thinking about this book because we noticed that almost everyone is aware of the wildfires, droughts, floods, and the unbearable heat that global warming is causing. But people still avoid taking action to stop the climate crisis. For a lot of people, the subject seems too scientific and complicated to understand. Or it seems too big for one person to do anything about or it seems too political to discuss, or too scary. I'm going to try to change that tonight. Our dream for the book, Cool, is that women leaders' stories will demystify global warming and inspire readers to take action. This evening, we hope to inspire you to take action to start reversing global warming and cool the earth. So, what is global warming, and how does it work? When I was in fourth grade, I learned about the water cycle. Simply put, rain falls and flows through rivers to collect in lakes and oceans. There, the water will evaporate and form clouds, which then make rain again. Simple, for humans to live happily, this cycle must be in balance. Too little water and it's a drought, too much rain and there's a flood. The carbon cycle is similar. Carbon dioxide is actually a good thing. It's necessary for life on Earth. Carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants and later released back into the atmosphere when each plant decomposes. Oceans, lakes, and streams also absorb, absorb carbon dioxide. This natural balance between just enough CO2 in the air, but not too much, lasted for millions of years until we big-brained humans discovered how to release the energy in carbon by burning gas, oil, and coal. Burning those fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere more than the environment can absorb. The extra carbon emissions trap the sun's heat, creating global warming. We are all responsible for global warming. This isn't about selfish corporations, evil politicians, or powerful lobbyists pushing bad laws. No, we all participate. The Commonwealth Club is a lead certified building, but think about the clothes we're wearing that were shipped around the world. Think about the vehicle that transported you here tonight. We are all contributing to the CO2 imbalance. If we continue as we live today, the earth will no longer support the life we know. We interviewed one leader who stopped talking mid-sentence and looked at my grandmother with uncertainty. She realized that she was talking about the end of our species, and it could sound really scary to 11-year-old me. I'm not paralyzed with fear. I'm inspired by the women I met while we were making this book. They're actually making change. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so can you. In a few minutes, we're gonna tell you some of their stories. Decreasing greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming will take all of us working together. Policymakers, businesses, nonprofits, academics, individuals, families. So why focus on women, people ask me. This will be my seventh book about women activists around the globe. I tell their stories because all too often women's stories go untold. But this time, there was an additional reason. New research suggests that women are more effective at improving the environment. 
and that's true for governments that are run by women, companies with women in charge, women who lead investment firms, and women legislators. And that means that women climate leaders' climate actions make them role models for all of us. Avery and I started working on this book with great excitement. Imagine your co company is counting on you to invent sustainably sourced plastics to replace the petroleum-based plastics they relied on for 60 years to manufacture what Fortune magazine named the toy of the century. And your company, which has been identified as having the best corporate reputation in the world, has decided to make its products 100% sustainable by 2030. Are you up for it? It's my dream job, according to Neliki Vanderpool. She's a chemical engineer who is vice president of materials at Lego Corporation. Neliki admits, what I've always liked about chemistry is solving difficult challenges. Doing something good for the planet is important to me. It's great that I can do this with an organization that delights children and adults across the world. Neliki says, Lego wants to leave the planet in the best shape possible for kids. Our owners have made this a strategic priority. Neliki works at Lego's headquarters in Denmark. Lego's suppliers developed the new plastics under her supervision. Neliki's lab is the place where new bioplastics are tested for color, shininess, durability, and other qualities, all of which must be the same as Lego's high quality conventional plastics. In 2018, the company could introduce an entire Lego set made from sugarcane based plastic, sugar cubes. The set, which included trees and shrubs, was called Plants from Plants. Plants from Plants included more than 80 shapes, but Neliki points out that Lego makes something like 4,000 shapes. We need to invent replacements for more than 20 types of plastics. When they're ready, we'll substitute them into our sets. You won't be able to tell the difference. The suppliers who develop new bioplastics with Lego can license them to manufacturers who make many different kinds of products. Neliki told us, by changing our behavior, we're enable, we enable our suppliers, other customers, to take advantage of our efforts. Then she smiled. You're about to meet an Inuit leader, Sheila Watt Cloutier. She was pe president of Canada's Circumpolar Council. She also led the Council's international work in Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. She earned so many awards for her activism that the list takes up three Wikipedia pages. Plus, she's featured on a Canadian postage stamp. Climate change is causing the Arctic to warm twice as fast as the rest of the planet. In fact, new studies released last week suggest that parts of the Arctic may be warming five to seven times as fast. The permafrost is melting, so in Sheila's village, buildings buckle, houses sink, runways crack, the coast is eroding, Snowmobiles have fallen through the ice. The day I interviewed Sheila, it was 78 degrees in the Arctic. These impacts are not merely physical, they are cultural. Hunting is a cornerstone of the Inuit culture, but the animals and marine mammals that the Inuit hunt for food and clothing are also struggling. Snow and ice represent mobility, says Sheila, who grew up traveling by dog sled. When mobility starts to go, everything becomes precarious. We are the sentinels, she continues. We live at the top of the world, so we're the first to witness the changes that are happening to our planet. We are scientists in our own right, she continues. Western scientists say they've learned from our hunters the marriage of their science and our traditional knowledge has been groundbreaking. Indigenous wisdom, she says, is the medicine we seek to create a sustainable world. In her book, Sheila writes, our shared atmosphere and oceans, not to, not to mention our human spirit, connects us all. It's important that climate change is not framed just as an economic, science, scientific, and political issue. It's a human issue. As far as I know, she was the first 
to frame climate change as a human issue. Sheila continues, I urge to move people from their heads to their hearts where change happens and to know that change creates an opportunity to flourish in the future, to create a better world. But we need to act. Mother Earth is a living, breathing entity, Sheila says. When you're out in nature, you can sense that Mother Earth is reaching her limits. Just outside Arusha, Tanzania, we picked up Juliette Malel, the Maasai woman we were going to visit. She had taken a two-hour boda boda, that's a motorcycle taxi, to help us find her house because there were no road names, signs, or house numbers most of the way. Getting there was like skiing on moguls. At first, the road was bumpy with chunks of rocks. Then it was unpaved and rutted. Then the road ended, but we kept on going. I was about to discover why the NGO Solar Sister works with last mile communities. Fatma Mutso, Solar Sister's Tanzania country director, understands what life is like for women in these countries. Without light, she says, there's no access to quality education or health services. In my home village, there's no electricity, but people are happy now, they have solar. Solar Sister <laughs> provides solar products to women entrepreneurs in communities where families typically use kerosene, candles, flashlights, or wood fires to light their homes. Solar Sister's most popular product in Tanzania is a portable table lamp that runs off a solar panel. Solar Sister entrepreneurs also sell telephone chargers, home lighting systems, and clean cook stoves, which operate on a solar charger that can be installed outside or on the roof. Fatma says, what I'm proudest of is Solar Sisters' unique model. Few organizations here work with women, and even fewer work with women and energy. Many village women don't have sources of income. If they have a seasonal crop business, they have to wait months to harvest and sell. But if they sell solar, they earn money every day. Fatma mentioned, we did a survey to measure Solar Sisters' impact, and it showed that our women are being respected and making family decisions. They have the same strong voices as their husbands, and many have been able to become village leaders because they are confident and empowered. Scientists say that mangrove trees, let's see if I can show you one. <laughs> mangrove trees sequester five times more carbon dioxide than tropical trees. Mangroves not only absorb carbon dioxide, they bury it in the soil. A nonprofit called Sudisa includes women in every village along the Sri Lanka coast. Their women-led community cooperatives include 15,000 women, and at all times, each woman is growing 100 mangrove seedlings in her backyard. Every year, they sow 1.5 million mangrove seedlings in the, the Sri Lanka coastal lagoons. Members of the co-op also monitor the mangrove forests and report people like shrimp farmers who try to cut the trees down. Their voices carry weight. Officials respond immediately. One morning, three groups of women from the village of Mandel gathered to plant mangrove trees. They arrived at the lagoon by bicycle and motorcycle and boat. They were Muslim and Tamil and Sinhalese, but despite their differences, their commitment to the mangroves unites them. Wearing bright clothes but barefooted, they embedded seedlings in the dark silt at the water's edge, and then they rinsed their hands and feet, rolled out straw mats, opened thermoses, and served us ginger tea in china cups. One more story. As a child, Clover Moore was the leader of a group she named the Scarlet Pimpernels of Neptune. 
Scarlet Pimpernel's of Neptune. She and her class led her classmates through walks in the National Park. Now, Lord Mayor Clovermore one is, leads one of the world's greatest cities, Sydney, Australia. She is the Lord, first woman elected Lord Mayor and the longest serving mayor in the city's 179 year history. As a child, the mayor to be exhibited two attributes that have served Sydney well. One was an ability to convince people to do what she, to follow her lead. And second was a passion for her national, natural surroundings, which prompted her as a child to give her parents trees as birthday presents. When Clover and her husband moved to a South Sydney suburb in the 1970s, she noticed that the neighborhood park was a dust-covered concrete slab. South Sydney refused to lay grass because it said it would make it too difficult to sweep up the broken glass. She decided to deal with that. With no political experience or allies, she ran for the local council in 1980 and won. And that led to a series of other um, elected positions. And she said, after I was elected mayor in 2004, we discovered that 97% of Sydney residents wanted action on climate change. So we committed to reducing emissions in the local government by 70% by 2030. I have to tell you, we climbed out the window of her office to be on the roof so we could have her photographed with the trees. She continues, we have planted more than 13,000 trees. We've installed more than 4,000 rooftop panels, changed street lights to LED bulbs, upgraded the city's fleet to hybrid and electric vehicles, expanded the public transportation and promoted it, and added bike lanes. Those are just some of the ways we've sought to address climate change, she told us, and they've proved effective. We were Australia's first local city to be certified carbon neutral, she says. That certification happened in 2011. Now, I don't know about you, but 2011 seems to me to be a long time before 2030, her target date. The city of Sydney belongs to C40 Cities, a group that shares knowledge and acts together to address the climate crisis. The Lord Mayor says, without urgent, coordinated global action, we face the risk of runaway climate change. Clover Moore, the girl who gave her parents trees as birthday gifts, now shows the world's cities how to prevent runaway climate change. Every chapter in the book ends with ideas that leaders suggest readers can do to fight global warming. Each list of ideas is connected via QR code to the project website, which gives details about exactly how to act on those suggestions. For example, Clover Moore said, never ever stop demanding more from your elected representatives. We added links that will help you do exactly that. You can also access the leader's ideas by going to the project website, which is coolreversingglobalwarming.com, click on the Act tab, and you'll see all the women leaders' suggestions for climate action. Every woman leader we interviewed, we had used multiple strategies. Think about Clovermore in Sydney. She upgraded her fleet to hybrids and electric cars. She added to their public transportation. She added bike lanes and more. Inspired by the leader's multiple strategies, Avery and I decided that we would make a climate action plan for our book. We offset our airline miles by donating trees to EarthDay.org's Canopy Project. We ask our publisher to print the book with linseed oil ink 
and paper certified by Forest Stewardship Council, which is sustainably produced. Avery designed our business cards, and she had them printed at moo.com on paper that was made from 100% recycled t-shirts. We have arranged to have a tree planted for every book that's sold. And last, 100% of our author royalties will go to the Women's Earth Alliance to provide seed funding to organizations started by women around the world, either nonprofits or for-profits, that will help reverse global warming. We're telling you about our climate action plan because we hope you will call a family meeting to create your own family climate action plan with multiple strategies. A Washington Post study last year found that 57% of young people are afraid of climate change. We've been asking public and private school kids the three questions we asked you in the beginning of the talk. Most learn about climate change in class and feel it is important and urgent. Many of us are advocating for action. There's plenty for all ages to do. Younger children can pledge to turn off the lights when they leave the room. Older children can ask their school cafeteria to serve more plant-based meals. Parents and grandparents can install solar panels. Maybe they can buy an electric car next time or check out induction stoves and heat pumps. If you're an investor, you can vote your shares to make corporations, corporations more accountable on climate issues. Everyone can use their voice, their vo vote, and their money to support local, state, and federal officials who will reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Actions beget actions. If we act, we'll inspire others to act, and they will inspire others. We can scale up and create critical mass. Cool describes women climate leaders, but lots of men are also doing great work. A few years ago, I met a Native American named Nick Tilson, who has a long ponytail and wears incredible beaded costumes made by his grandmother. Nick said his tribe doesn't believe people own the earth, but that we are merely caretakers for future generations. I like this perspective. So think about the kids in your family. If you want them to know the world you inherited from your grandparents, you must take action for them. Act now. Right now. Each of you will find a cool action pack on your chair. It's a present from us. Take it home with you. Organizations in the book contributed items to the action pack that will equip you to act immediately. You'll find a guide to climate conversations from the Climate Museum in New York. There's a nap time postcard you can write to your elected representatives while your child is sleeping. That comes from the Moms Clean Air Force. There's some vegetable seeds to start your family on the way to a plant-based diet. These are simple things you can do easily, and you each will officially become climate activists. This obviously isn't enough, but it's a start. Saving our species is an existential challenge that will take all of us working together. Avery and I look forward to the existential impact that you and we are about to create together. Thanks, Mark. So I've got lots of questions. Good. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't written one yet and you would like to ask a question, please think about it and hand it off to one of the members of the staff. So you talk to an incredibly diverse geographically, ethnically, and in terms of different types of organizations, just the people that you spoke with. What was your approach in choosing these women to spotlight? Oh, we spent almost a year before we began interviewing um, trying to figure out how to balance this book. Um, and all of those points of difference that you just mentioned were very much on our mind. For example, we wanted to have countries represented that were the worst polluters, and that includes China and the United States and India. All three of those countries are represented. We wanted to have countries that are experiencing the 
very bad impacts of climate change. That includes the Arctic and Tanzania, which we talked about. We wanted to represent cities as well as rural areas, Sydney, Sri Lanka. Um, and we wanted to represent as many different kinds of work environments where we could see important work being done. Um, because we were aware that this was the first book, um, and so far still, as far as I know, is the only book about women around the world who are making this kind of difference. So there are, for example, the heads of a museum. There is someone who started a dance um, theater, um, and there is a chemist who is making, inventing new kinds of plastics. Um, you have just barely scratched the surface. Um, but there is a broad range of women doing very important work, and we wanted to imply how broad that range is. So as you traveled around the world, you saw these various innovative ways that women work with their resources and environment to combat climate change. What were some of the most surprising? The most surprising? Um, I found most, one of the most surprising was a woman named Molly Burhans. Molly, when, the year after she got her master's degree, she's American, um, she had wanted to be a nun, and she had the idea that the Catholic Church, as the world's largest landholder, had the potential to use their lands, for example, as um, areas where trees could be planted or where they could be monitoring um, water erosion and so forth. Um, and she was heartened by the encyclical that Pope Francis wrote and managed to get herself to Rome, met the Pope four times, and was assigned a cardinal to work with her because it turns out that although they are the world's largest landholder, the Catholic Church had never mapped all of the lands. So they had to do that before they could begin working on projects with the various owners. Um, and I thought that was a very surprising and wonderful new idea. Um, was the kind of creativity that we saw consistently as we were interviewing. So here's, a, here's the opposite question. Who did you not get a chance to interview that you would love to talk to in the future when you do your next book? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, we have only 27 women in this book. I ended up with a list. I bet we had hundreds. Um, I was fortunate to have the Women's Earth Alliance acting as my counselor um, because suddenly I would have 50 and I would need to get to, well, I thought 25, and I would call Melinda Kramer, who runs the Women's Earth Alliance out of Oakland, and say, do you know any of these people? Who could we possibly cut? I could do book after book after book. I hope some of you will um, about these women. I have such a long list of really interesting, important um, work that, they are, that women are doing. And Avery, if you had a chance to talk to someone who was on the list that you didn't get to talk to. Uh, I bet I you would like know. to talk to Greta Thunberg. I was going to say, but she's like not... I mean, kind of part of life. She, when we started this book, she had not yet begun her Fridays for Future project. But she certainly took hold. It'd be really cool to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really cool to talk to her, but you'd have to definitely get there in a carbon neutral way. You have to like <laughs> sail over to see her or something. After all, she sailed to the US instead of flying. So for Avery, here's a question for you. What surprised you the most as you traveled to these far-flung places? Um, I'd say... Maybe, like, how creative each of these women leaders were. Like, I would have never thought... Um, to start some of these organizations that they were. Um, when we went to Arusha, Tanzania, 
you know, it seemed like they didn't have, like, they weren't, didn't have many resources, um, and yet they were still able to create something that every, that um, was very useful to a lot of people and changed a lot of people's lives, like the solar lamps. I'll jump in and tell about how that organization got started. Do you remember the story they told us? The woman who started Solar Sister actually lives in the United States, um, and she had been in um, Tanzania and happened to have 24 solar land lamps. And she was traveling with a friend. They drove up to the top of a mountain. There was a store up there run by a woman, and she said, I have 24 of these lamps. Do you want to see if you can sell them? And the woman said, sure, leave them with me. And so they then parted company. And before they got to the bottom of the mountain, the cell phone was ringing. And the woman at the store said, well, now what? <laughs> and she had sold every one of them immediately. That's really cool. I, I've been to been to Tanzania myself, and I think one of the great powers is the ability for for people to have solar lights um, because it reduces the use of fire for light, helps kids do their homework. I mean, there's multiple benefits to it, so it's it's really great to see them getting out into the community. So we have another question from someone here in the audience, and this is, this is a question I think probably directed to you, Avery. What can someone do in their everyday life to help protect the environment? What would you recommend? Um, well, on a smaller scale, you could do the simple things like just turning off the lights when you leave a room, um, trying to use as little water as possible. And I'd say something like possibly the easiest thing you can do is educate yourself and kind of spread the word, talking with others. Um, yeah. So here's one for you, Paula. This is your seventh book that focuses on women. Can you speak to the power of women as individuals and groups? What has drawn you to focus on women, their work, and their strength as a subject? Hmm. Um, I have, since I first, um, since my first job, I have worked mostly with women. Um, I have encouraged and mentored women. Um, I am a woman. It has been totally apparent to me from the beginning that there are inequalities of education and possibility, health. There are so many issues um, that need to be addressed um, that I really ha wanted to spend my bookmaking life focusing on making those issues visible. But that was before we began understanding how existential the issue of climate change is. And although those other issues are crucially important and still very important to me, um, it seemed to me that I really needed to focus if I expected my projects to have an impact. So now I'm thinking um, about the power that we can all bring to this issue, not only by demystifying climate change, but also by sharing ways to take action. Well, so here's a, a related question. and. and as an admired photographer, you understand the power of an image. So what does that power look like in relation to climate change and global warming? How can photography be a galvanizer for action? Oh, I think art, not just photography, but art in general can, can galvanize action. I would love, Chrissy, I would love to, tap you and invite you to address the question of art as a motivator. Do you want to talk about that for a minute as it applies to theater? Well, we have to get her on a microphone, so. Oh, the microphone is coming. I'm hoping you have something <laughs> yeah. you'd like to say. <laughs> no, going going yeah. um, oh, dear. That's such an interesting question to me because 
um, I do believe that art motivates people, and I do believe that it can be a tool for social change, and a very powerful tool for social change. And I also, it doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily get the end results that we're all looking for at this point. You know, I feel, well, first of all, I'm kind of grappling with the word existential right now because that's the word that Greta Thunberg used. It, this is an existential threat. But now I'm like thinking like, what is an existential threat? I actually just say, thought, oh, that's fabulous, but I don't really even know what that means. But what I do feel is the situation is dire. It's dire. What we're, what we're doing right now is we're looking at what happened in Florida. And if you are putting the pieces together right now, it's directly related to sea level rise, the, the amount of water that surged into Florida. So we are under uh, enormous threat. I don't know if it's existential or not, but it's huge. And so what I do as an artist is just try to take all the information, do as much research as I can, apply a sense of beauty and depth to the situation, mush it around and then turn it around and put it out and hope that I have inspired, motivated, and delved into the situation with some intelligence that will enact some sort of social change. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank yeah. you. Well, I have to say personally that, that seeing is believing, and so the opportunity to see the effects of climate change in places around the world has a much bigger impact on me personally, and I think it does for others as well. And so I think the power of photography and film to, to share that is a really important element of this. So speaking of, of this sort of believing what is happening. Do either of you have advice for talking with friends and family who are skeptical about climate change? It's not anyone in this room, we did a survey. Um, or perhaps think that they are too insignificant to make a real change. The very best outline about how to approach conversations, I think, is the one that you have in your packets right now that came from the Climate Museum in New York. Um, we had originally hoped that the things in the action pack could be blown in between the pages of the book. You know how sometimes they blow in postcards and so forth? But the printer turned out not to have that capability, so I said, send them to me and I will put them on every chair when we present the Climate Ambassador card that came from the Climate Museum folds up into a credit card size guide for having a climate conversation. And the points around which they have organized the conversation is, it's real, experts agree, it's us, it's bad, and now is the time. So there is a wonderful little outline that you can f cut out, fold up, and put in your pocket. Um, and keep with you, and it will help you, um, because it steers these points as they are presented here, steer clear of the kind of finger pointing um, that is so uh, divisive uh, in these conversations. The most, uh, I just read today um, that as of 2021, there were 139 members of Congress, 30 senators and the rest were representatives, who are receiving so much money from the oil and gas and coal companies as lobbyists that in fact they have decamped from real consideration. They are real climate deniers. I think that it probably is not worth your time to try to convince those people to take action, but in fact, to motivate people who are concerned and who recognize at least, as we said at the beginning, climate change is real. Maybe they don't think it's urgent, but moving those into the climate change is real and urgent is something that we can do by having these kinds of conversations. 
So I have two questions that stem from what you were just talking about. One that goes in one direction and one that goes in another. But I'm going to start with the first one. The book is so carefully constructed. You've thought of everything. So in designing it, it's really very contemporary. It has illustrations, photos, cursive pull quotes, QR codes, and the effect of it is to make a very complicated subject accessible. So it seems perfect for schools, libraries. What do you think of this idea? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My dream would have it be in school libraries, but also in city libraries. Um, this book has turned out to be much more than we originally intended it to be, um, some, a book that is applicable to all age groups. Um, and although it has been very carefully designed to motivate action, you're absolutely right about that, wherever that question came from, um, it was never dumbed down. Um, there is a huge amount of information in this book. And if you follow the QR codes to the website, it elaborates the suggestions that the women leaders have made. So for example, Clover Moore said you must ask your elected representatives, never stop asking. Um, if you go to the website using the QR code, you will find out how to identify the ways to contact your elected officials. You will find out how to write them an email and what to say. You'll find out how, an outline of what to say if you talk with their staffers on the phone. And you'll find out how to enroll in Al Gore's advocacy training program. So how you do these climate actions is built into the book. Um, and I'm happy to say that Powerhouse Books, which was the publisher, um, was very actively engaged in trying to figure out how to make this happen. They had, including the idea of blowing in um, items, um, many ideas about how to engage people. This was never intended to be a book that you just looked at. So the, you may actually have answered this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, um, because it, it identifies a, spe a specific framework to think about. And this comes from Jessica Lee, uh, and it's focused on climate education and the ACE framework, namely action for climate empowerment. How do we strengthen it? What tips do you have as we work towards advancing the ACE framework and climate education? And she writes, for example, she's working to expand climate education in schools and the community. Please provide some thoughts on how climate education can be scaled up. Hmm. <laughs> um, my goodness. She probably knows so much more about this than I do that I hesitate to, to jump in and, and sound naive about it. But part of scaling up climate education in the communities, it seems to me, can happen rather informally. It can happen as we talk to our friends. It can happen as they talk to their friends. Um, the idea of education doesn't need to be formal. In other words, it doesn't require that we sit in front of you. Um, we can all talk with each other and with people whom we know um, in a much less formal kind of educational environment. Um, and one of the women we interviewed who started an organization called One Million Women um, out of Australia said, you know, you really don't have to understand everything about climate change in order to act. And that's true. What you need to do is understand enough that you can act. So sometimes too much information is paralyzing. And on the other hand, the program that Jessica Lee is writing about may be fabulous. I just don't know about it. Well, and it gives you something to study now. Exactly. <laughs> you have to learn it gives more. gives me something to find out about. Well, so one of the themes that, that runs through this work is, of course, a focus on women and what women are doing to take on global warming. So this question really focuses on that. Women worldwide still often struggle to attain equal rights. 
equal pay, and in some cases are treated like second-class citizens. With this in mind, what does equitable climate activism look like, and what does it mean for you? Um, there is a lot of discussion about the fact that women are often the um, most damaged by climate change. Um, in many parts of Africa, for example, uh, where it's women who do the farming, there suddenly isn't enough water to grow the crops that they are used to growing. I was in um, Sri Lanka and interviewing women in the communities there, and there was a woman who had five cows. They gave only enough milk for the family and a little bit that she could sell, and those cows had nothing to eat because there was such a drought. Um, so the women, it is definitely true that women and girls are most hard hit by climate change. Um, on the other hand, it is also those women who often understand the solutions best. Remember, M M one Jiri Matai, um, who was the first woman I heard about wanting, encouraging people to plant trees to hold the soil in place. Um, and her daughter continues that work today. So the very women who are the least equitably represented in climate action often are the most capable of causing change. Yeah, she's, she was wonderful. She, any problem, plant a tree, she would say. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a related question, and it's specifically about health impacts. Um, are there, did you identify or did people talk about um, the impacts on their health associated with climate change during your interviews? Hmm. No, that really is not a subject that was encompassed by um, what, what we were focused on. Another thing to explore. Exactly, a whole <laughs> other book. <laughs> so let me ask you this, and, and, and I'll ask Avery first. What was it like for the two of you to work on this book? It's an intergenerational project, and what was it like working with your grandmother on it? Well, I feel very lucky to have had this opportunity and um, my grandmother brought, you know, her life experiences, and um, I kind of brought like a fresh perspective and an understanding of younger readers, as I am one. Um, and <laughs> sorry, um, I by working together, I think that we created something that appeals to a broader audience. And it was a great bonding experience. And we made work that I was really proud of. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Paolo, for you? Um, everything that she said. <laughs> Ditto. Um, I will say that if any of you have an opportunity to hang out with a 12-year-old for a year or so, do it, do it, do it. Um, it could change your life. Everybody says to me, oh, she was so lucky to work with you. I'll tell you something. I learned so much from Avery. I'll give you an example. Um, I have done six books. I've interviewed women in 62 countries. I'm pretty sure I know how to interview. And I always start with factual questions so that people don't get spooked. And after a while, when they trust me, I then move to more personal questions. Avery knew, because we had made up the questions together, <laughs> that I would have maybe 20 questions. And so we got through the first interview, and it was very clear that these were busy women who had allocated an hour to talk to us. And Avery said, Grandmother, I have a suggestion. I'll be the timekeeper. We'll pick the six most important questions, and at the 10-minute point, we'll go to the next question, and then to the next question, and then to the next. At the end of an hour, we'll have the six most important questions answered. And I can't tell you how hard it was for me not to say, that'll never work. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, oh, 
let's try it. <laughs> and of course, she was absolutely right. These are very busy women who went straight to the core of the questions, responded immediately and fully, and at the end of an hour, we had the six most important questions answered. And as she said, if we had more time, we could ask more questions. But guess what? We had an hour. <laughs> so I learned a huge amount from Avery, um, and I'm very glad. The other thing I wanted to mention is that it, this really was an intergenerational project. Um, my son, Scott Sangster, who's Avery's father, sitting here in the front row, um, came with us um, when we were traveling around the United States, and he's a wonderful photographer and f shot photographs with us. Um, I think he had originally taught you how to do photography. Is that true? Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my husband, who is a writer, did the editing of the manuscript. So it really was a multi-generational project. Um, and several people commented that it was important because of that, since all generations will be affected and are being affected by climate change. So to stick with the intergenerational theme, Avery, I'm going to put you on the spot again. Uh-oh. <laughs> What's the most important thing you would want adults to understand about the effects of climate change on your generation? Okay. Um, Channel Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Um, I think I would want adults to know that... Oh, this is such a hard question. Well, it matters. Yeah, it, it's trying to choose my words carefully. Um, I think that it's really important for them to know how much it affects um, kids, because, like, even though it might global warming might like the peak of it might not happen while they're still alive, um, it will really impact the kids um, and their kids. Uh, and so I think that they need to start taking action because that will also inspire kids. Um, I think some kids are waiting for adults to m take the action for them. And I think adults that need to like lead the way and lead by example, that answers your question. Kinda. That's a great answer. Well, so now you, you, you lead right into the second part of the question, the next, the other generation. And that is, what would you tell young people who say they want to do something to reverse climate change, but they don't know how? Um, well, I'd say, like I mentioned earlier, first educate yourself, because that's really important, and talk to your friends about global warming, because you can't really solve a problem if you don't fully understand it, or at least the basics. Um, and just start acting immediately because it's a really pressing issue. Um, even though it seems really big, you shouldn't be intimidated. Not all actions have to be these grand gestures. Um, the small things make an impact too and will build up over time. Also a good answer, see? <laughs> So now that you're older, um, what experiences or people from this journey have stuck with you in creating this book? What are the things that just sort of stay with you? Um, well, I was really inspired by all these women um, because, I mean, when I started this book, I knew, you know, a little bit about climate change, but like the facts and stuff, but um, these women showed me that, like, exactly how to act, and um, I kind of, I was also overwhelmed. You know, I thought I'd have to f solve everything all at once, but these organizations kind of chose one thing and fully dedicated themselves, and so I think that kind of taught me that to kind of just take it one step at a time and you know focus on one aspect of reversing global warming and fully dedicate myself to that great that's a great answer so what are you going to do now now you're in high school and you've you've already written a book and 
set up a website. What are you planning to do next? Um, well, obviously global warming is still a thing and the book was just the beginning for me. Um, I'm actually the environmental representative on my student, on student council at my school. Um, and so I'm making sure that reversing global warming is um, a, ta a top priority for my school. Great. Well, so we're getting close to the end, end of the program, and there's been a lot of great questions. So thank you, everyone, for all these great questions. And, and I want to I wanna try and sort of focus on the positive here. So I'd like to ask both of you to just think for a moment and, and tell us about what gives you hope. All of you give me hope. Um, and your response to the questions that I ask at the beginning that gives me hope. The shift that we are beginning now to see, the recognition that climate change is real and urgent, um, which all of you shared, um, that not, has not always been true. As recently as five years ago, that was definitely not the case. So that gives me great hope. Um, kind of like our mother said, uh, everyone here meeting all the leaders of the organizations, um, seeing people of different ages participating in rallies, um, people buying our book, the people who come to events like tonight, it shows me that people do care. There are people out there who want to reverse global warming, and and I believe that if enough of us want change, change will happen. Yeah. Well, I have to say that you both give me hope because of the work that you put into this, and it's great to see um, a grandmother and a granddaughter just inspired to do something that makes a difference. So that gives me hope, and I hope it gives everyone else hope as well. So thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank the audience here in the room and also online for taking part. And if you would like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts to make virtual and in-person programming uh, more available, please do visit our website, commonwealthclub.org. And if you'd like to purchase a copy of this wonderful book, Cool, Women Leaders Reversing Global Warming, Please stick around afterwards because I think Paula and Avery would be delighted to sign them and talk more with you tonight. Thank you, Paula and Avery, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>